thank you. After this fast flash stress presentation, for sure we, we all will turn into a diamonds, uh, like it was explained this, this morning. So, uh, in this paper, we try to answer to this question for the special case where uh, we have price competition faced by retailers, um, uh, merchants, that uh, market uh, experience goods. Uh, this is a particular case where experience good, uh, you know that uh, people need uh, to go to the physical store just to have personally experiences with the product uh, before they decide to buy this, this product. So we consider this, this, uh, this situation. So, so um, in, in our case, we look at a scenario with, 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 uh, which, uh, which considers that uh, retailers, merchants, use both two types of uh, channels of distribution that are physical channels of distribution and also digital channels of distribution. We construct a model through game theory that considers a three-step game uh, so in, the, in the area of non-cooperative games where there are two types of players. Uh, the first type are the consumers that uh, want to buy those, uh, those goods, those products. And uh, the second type of, of players are uh, the, the retailers. Uh, of course, consumers want to increase, to obtain, to gain the uh, greatest utility. And in, in the case of, uh, of uh, retailers, the chance, they compete to obtain uh, maximum profits uh, possible. So the, the three-step game is in this way. In the first part of, of the game, uh, consumers, consumers has, has to decide if they go to buy to, to, uh, to a physical store or they decide to buy uh, to, to the, the physical store uh, where they, they can buy the, 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 the product or they, they want to try to another, uh, another uh, physical uh, store. So this is the first part of the game. In the second, in the second step of the game, the retailers decide decides to, uh, in, uh, to have in, 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 the, in the firm the possibility of two different channels of distribution, the physical channel and the digital channel. In this case, they can decide to increase prices, to set equal prices. <laughs> my name is Sogo Clement and I'm from the Humanities Department and I'm presenting this uh, work which is uh, mine and from and by Antonio Oliver. Uh, it's mainly uh, the work of Antonio Oliver. Uh, we, we belong to the Language Processing Group, which is a group which is uh, devoted to investigate uh, natural language, natural language processing, either by machines or by, or by, by the brain, uh, producing or understanding language. And this, this work is framed uh, uh, in a Spanish uh, ministerial project. One, one, of, his, uh, one of, the, of the aims of this project is uh, working on, on what uh, is called a textual entertainment. Textual entertainment means uh, provide the means to a machine to understand that uh, given two, two pieces of, of text, like in this, <laughs> Given two pieces of text, uh, the machine has to decide if, if one of the texts is, inf is logically inferred or, or, or derived from, uh, by the other one. Uh, which is interesting in this task is that you, you need to use a lot of uh, linguistic resources and, and processors to, to make these decisions. And uh, one of the, mo the most important resources is, is uh, what we call word nets. Word nets are lexical uh, nets, lexical nets, uh, words uh, related by, by semantic uh, relations. And our work is devoted to build this kind of, of resource 
for the languages lacking this kind of resource and uh, uh, even to enlarge uh, our languages uh, resource to enlarge Catalan and, 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 and Spanish wordnet. Uh, we do this uh, by means of uh, automatic methods, I mean, uh, automatic method, uh, and uh, we use uh, free resources. That means that, that we, we use basically uh, a wordnet from English, which is already built and, and is quite complete, and then we use uh, parallel, parallel texts in English and the other language. Uh, parallel text means text uh, which one is the translation of, of the other. And another mean is uh, to, to get uh, English text and, and translate it by machine translation. And uh, doing several interesting operations with these resources, uh, we, we get to build a WordNet for a new language with some precision and recall, which is never perfect. Yeah. That's all. Thank you. So I'm going to present you a project, and I'm going to use a video that we have created. I will be very quick because... <laughs> oh. Social intervention for children with recurrent abdominal pain and their parents. Our main objective is to prevent long term disability. And for this purpose, we have created uh, 73 units for parents and 73 units for, for children. And we want to teach them these coping strategies and give it information to, to help them to cope better with, with their pain. And I'm going to show you another short video with the main features of the program. Uh, I'm talking about the control, cognitive control of action. Cognitive uh, control of action is a, a very uh, complex uh, cognitive uh, process, and the key uh, brain areas uh, involved in the, in the control cognitive of action are the inferior cortex, the pre-supplementary motor area, and the some structural brain areas from the basal ganglia, like like uh, caudate nucleus, <coughs> thalamic nucleus. We have uh, one uh, our hypothesis is uh, that in activation of uh, presupplementary motor cortex and with uh, transcranial magnetic uh, stimulation like uh, EMS 
and the inactivation of the inferior frontal cortex uh, alter disturb inhibition and switch behavior showing a critical contribution of these two areas during control, control of action. Uh, for us it's a very important uh, thing to, to investigate with EMS and uh, in the lab. Uh, the task is uh, very, very, very complicated uh, and, and when each trial a fixation uh, point was presented uh, followed by, by an arrow. Participants were asked uh, to respond as fast as possible to detect the arrow direction. On the stop condition, a weight cross will appear. Participants had to, to do nothing in, in this condition. Sometimes the arrow changed uh, to blue. And the participants ha had to generate another response. It's uh, the switch response in cognitive control. That the main results uh, in our study uh, support the notion that both areas, the pre premotor supplementary area and the frontal inferior cortex, are involved in, in cognitive operation, in cognitive like switching, uh, inhibition, and, uh, and response inhibition. Thank you. I'm sorry, but I will talk about accounting and financial statements, but it's only three minutes, so I suppose <laughs> that's not any <laughs> So we can say that after seven years since the international financial reporting standards were implemented in Europe, we can say now that these uh, rules, this normative about how we have to present the financial information, has been accepted both for preparers and users. Uh, one of the most relevant group of users of financial information are analysts, and they use this information in order to assess and forecast the companies. <coughs> in this sense, the Moody's, the, credit, the rating agency Moody's, published in 2010 in their website a document called Moody's Approach to Global Standards Adjustment in the Analysis of Financial Statement for Non-Financial Corporations. In this document, the credit uh, analysis company um, proposes a, a, a number of adjustments that can, can be uh, made to the financial statements in order to give more comparability and also more, um, more capacity of, of inform about financial situations of the companies. Um, then we have used this adjustment and we have uh, constructed uh, an index called uh, Moody's Adjustment Disclosure Index, MADI, and uh, after, after composing this index, we have uh, analyzed two different questions. First of all, we have, uh, we, we have tried to demonstrate that these uh, international financial uh, report standards have improved the quality of the information that company uh, gives to uh, users of financial information, analysts, investors, and so on. And secondly, we have tried to determine which are the key factors that can explain why a company inform better than other companies. So these are two, uh, our two objectives. For this, we have uh, worked with a survey of UK quoted uh, companies that quoted in the FTSE uh, um, index. And we, uh, we have analyzed the years 2002, 2006, and 2012. These years are important for us because are some years before the implementation of these new uh, standards of financial information, the, the year right after the implementation of these standards, and then some years uh, after, which is the 2012. The methodology, um, uh, Joseph would explain better than me and faster than me for sure, so I will talk about the conclusions. Yeah, the conclusions are, are, are three, are mainly three different conclusions. First of all, we can we can say or we have appreciated that uh, many uh, has changed uh, specifically uh, in, a, in a significant way between 2002 and 2006. So we can say that the introduction of financial of the international financial reporting standard has really improved the financial information. Secondly, we can say that uh, the money, the index that we have uh, constructed and calculated, responds also to a higher level of homogenization of the films. And the third one, you can see the poster. <laughs> what I'm presenting today is a part of an international research project on mobile phones and older people. Today I'm focusing in low-income context. My three research questions are uh, how do low-income older people use mobile phones, if they do? What are the limitations they face, if they are? And uh, what are the motivations for not using mobile phones? 
Uh, to answer these three research questions, I approached a low-income district in Lima, in Peru. I conducted qualitative field work last September. Uh, there were 20 participants there. They were older people with ages over 60 years old. Um, results. First result is that most part of these seniors were mobile phone users. And the most important service for them was uh, voice communication. Then, for those who didn't use a mobile phone, with, I found people who would like to have one device if they have money, or, and other people who didn't want to have a mobile phone, they didn't care. Um, then, what I like to highlight are the restrictions and limitations some participants face. One is what I call asymmetric use. It appears when the elder never made a call. It, he or she had the mobile phone just for incoming calls. Somebody else in the family could use the airtime of this prepaid subscription, and this is linked to low income. The elder uh, and the family have low incomes, low skills, even illiteracy, and economic dependence on the rest of the family. The other case is discontinuities in use. The mobile phone is stolen, and there is no money to replace it immediately. Again, low income, economic dependence on older, on adult children, and in this case, the elder was not the breadwinner of the household. So, as a kind of conclusion, yes, skills are a point, low skills are shaping everything, uh, income restrictions are shaping as well the use of mobile phones, but here we found as well some specific restrictions that are related to the fact that these people were older people, because if you are not the breadwinner of the household, if uh, you depend economically on your adult children, and your skills for using the mobile phone are really limited, then you are not going to be the person who is going to take care of mobile phone communications within the household. But there will be others. This is why I argue that your position within the householders is going to shape or going to restrict the effective use you know, of mobile communication. And with this, I finish the presentation. <laughs> Uh, machine translation as well. Uh, machine translation is a concept that uh, I coined well from the PhD thesis of the, directed by Salvador Colimian. And well, um, machine translation is, refers to uh, the flavor of machine translation. It's a linguistic phenomenon that makes a translation sound uh, machine like. So something like comprendidas uh, sin hacer colas, without tails when you buy tickets for a bus. <laughs> so, well, the, the thing is that the, the, the work is divided into in two parts. The first part is to uh, make up a, a, a machine translationist typology from experimental uh, study in uh, machine translation uh, perception. And we develop this um, typology. And according to this typology, we, uh, we make that a metric that indicates how machine translation like is the translation. And for instance, this is a translation which is published on the web, and this has a, a machine translation score of 0 0.45. That means that it's quite machine like this translation. So, uh, we have developed experiments, and we uh, turned out that uh, our metric. Is, um, gives better results than uh, state-of-the-art metric machine translation metrics when we correlate the, the um, R metric to the machine translation uh, perception and machine translation quality. And this is the, the, this is the proof. And uh, apart from uh, changing the paradigm in machine translation evaluation, this work has other potentialities, it's like uh, improving the results in web searches Cheating this detection, for instance, uh, uh, language teachers uh, say, well, this is not a composition, this is ma uh, machine translation, that's all. And, of course, uh, understandability of web pages in a minority language. Um, minority languages published on the web uh, have a lot of machine translations. So if we have this metric, we can say, well, uh, don't rely on this page. If you see, for instance, los vocados detuvieron a los traficantes, Think that it's los osmosos de squadra. Okay? That's all. Thank you. I want to thank you so much for this stressful uh, presentation. <laughs>
uh, Benny told me, I am working in this project with uh, uh, Mercedes Serrano from Hospital de San Juan de Deu, Benny Gomez and Modesta Rosada here from the hospital. I from the world, no? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Benny told me that for me it's impossible to speak only three minutes. Carla Sicales knows perfectly the situation. For this reason, we have prepared a video. Please. <laughs> In Alpha's project, based in the Passive Model, the Lower Echoes project is working with different organizations, hospitals in the Dale, Cedar, and War. But the real and most important members of our team are the families of the European Federation of Lower Syndrome, with associations of France, Italy, Germany, UK, and Spain. One of the most relevant innovations is a combination of psychosocial models Good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to present this work entitled, as you already know, Time in Language, a psycholinguistic study on event creation in language comprehension. Okay, um, every day people hear or read about events in the world and effortlessly understand how long these events go on for. And here comes one of the main questions that I address in this research. How are people able to understand the duration of events from linguistic descriptions? Although little is known about this issue, temporal aspects of event representation are central to human cognition because event duration in language is likely to be linked to the representation of time more generally. So the main objective of this research is to investigate how we process and represent event duration in language comprehension. And specifically, I examine what the verbs referring to events of different duration are processed differently, and if so, what type of experience-based knowledge underlies their processing and representation. And well, as for the methods, I carried out six psycholinguistic experiments in which took part more than 300 participants. And well, I used several methods. I just only can say that I used mainly questionnaires, as well as what is called uh, self-paced reading tasks, which measure processing time. Uh, well, overall, uh, the results of these six studies show that A, uh, duration events occur in semantically more diverse contexts and elicit 
somatically more diverse associations than non-durative events, and B, um, understanding durative events requires more processing costs than, non than control one, indicating that more component situations are activated for durative events. And that's all that I can say in three minutes. If you are interested in this topic, I can explain you more about it. I'm very really glad uh, to explain you more about it. And please do not hesitate to contact me. Thank you. Hi. Um, well, this is a, a presentation of uh, results obtained by Vasile uh, Yosinkianos and, and myself. Uh, the idea is uh, studying uh, work productivity in service industries. Uh, work productivity depends on many factors. Uh, one of the most well-known factors is that uh, tangible capitals, uh, capital like machines or um, computers, help improve work productivity. We know that. Um, uh, it's thought in several, many uh, research uh, points to uh, intangible capital as an investment that also <coughs> Uh, results in increased work productivity, but in our research we posit that um, the simple fact of investing in intangible capital is not enough for having better productivity, but we think that stable work relations are needed. Um, in, in particular, what we think, we, what we research it, is that um, several types of intangible capital, which are intangible capital, I mean, the knowledge people have, the knowledge that the corporations have. Uh, intangible capital can be in form of human capital, education, for example, of the people in a corporation. It can be in the shape of relational capital, the relations you have with your consumers, with your providers. All these kind of intangible capitals could result in productivity increases, but we don't think it's always like this. We think that contingent work means non-permanent work relations, for example, temporary contracts, for example, self-employees, autonomous. Uh, we think that this kind of uh, work, not stable work relations, uh, hinder productivity potential of investments in uh, intangible capital. So we, what we are saying is that we have a moderation hypothesis in the, of the impact, uh, we think that contingent work arrangements have a moderator role in the relation between the organizational intangible capital and labor productivity. And we base this hypothesis in the resource base view of the firm, which I will not uh, explain now. Well, we have data from 449 service organizations in Catalonia. We have our model, and these are our results. And the, the main conclusion is that when you have low um, intangible capital in any of these two forms we studied, it doesn't really matter your contingent work arrangements. The productivity is the same. But if you have high intangible capital, your productivity is uh, hindered, it is lower than when you have many uh, contingent work arrangements. Contingent work arrangements. I'll back for productivity. <laughs> it just looks look like a contest of uh, Club de la Comedia. <laughs> so I can resist. Good night, Las Vegas. <laughs> well, uh, this paper is about uh, location, about economic geography, and also about public policies. So let me start with the context. The context was a uh, research that we conducted, I think, that seven years ago, before the, the beginning of the financial crisis. And when we are uh, analyzing the activities and the policies of Barcelona P. Barcelona P. is the local development agency in Barcelona. We were investigating uh, if uh, this kind of activities in Barcelona P. were helping the companies, and the, <coughs> much better, were helping the entrepreneurs who, who, which were creating uh, companies to become more innovative. Uh, and we find that a few companies, just a small amount of companies, really take profit at that moment of the, of the environment to uh, get a better, better economic performance. And we call this milieu effect. What does it mean, a milieu effect? It's not a melee. It's not a, some kind of uh, people discussing and fighting for where is the money while, while the money is going away. No. A uh, milieu effect is something difficult to measure. We create an indicator combining 
uh, for one side, the perceptions of the interpreters about the innovativeness of the environment, and also the real innovative behavior of the companies they were created. So we had four groups, and the best perceptions and the best innovative behavior, we call it milieu. So what's about our, our research at this moment? <clears throat> My, the, the key question is how things have changed over time. It means in a context of collapsing, when everybody is collapsing, is this milieu a, a kind of, yes, I love you too. Yes. <laughs> a kind of, a kind of, sorry, a kind of, uh, of shelter for entrepreneurs? Well, we had quantitative analysis and, well, there was all, uh, you can you can uh, check it in the in the poster, but the result is one. The milieu hasn't made a difference, so of course the most invested firms have been seriously handicapped, and finally internet hasn't made also the difference. So these are the the, the companies who have the best the best prediction of success. What does it mean? Clustering is nothing, absolutely nothing, and it's a big issue for companies and for sorry for. Uh, public policies without developing, uh, without helping companies to get, uh, to create more value, to find adequate funding, and to reach uh, new international markets. Thank you so much. I only have 10 or 12 slides. <laughs> well, uh, needless to say, uh, the, the topic of independence is a hot topic currently in Catalonia, and a good research question. And as a political scientist, obviously, we, we, we took advantage of this situation and we can present a lot of results everywhere. First idea. Support for independence has uh, dramatically, dramatically grown in Catalonia during the last years. And what we want to, uh, what we wanted to do in this, in this project was to assess the extent to which surveys reflect the real preferences of, 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 the, of the electorate, of the, of the citizens in Catalonia. Starting from two broad theoretical approaches used that tell us that individuals not always reveal their true preferences, whether because they don't have true preferences or whether because they don't feel comfortable uh, in expressing them. Okay? What we did was a quite sophisticated uh, model of imposition techniques using a multinomial uh, logistic regressions to assess the extent to which individuals revealed preference were congruent with their social political profiles. Okay, I cannot go into detail, obviously. But what we found is individuals are quite congruent with their with their social political profiles, no matter what their positions on the topic was. That is, people don't have problems in expressing their position regardless of they are in favor or against the issue of secession. This is an important finding for the, in, the, in our field, in the, in the political science field. And second is, obviously you, cannot see, you, you can see nothing from this, from this graph, but believe me if I tell you that... <laughs> that's good research. Uh, believe me if I say that uh, the more presence in the public sphere this topic uh, has, gains, the more people are willing to express their true preference. That is, the more is, 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 this debate is present in the, in, the, in the political sphere, in the political arena, people tend to express more clearly their, their preferences, matching with their social political profile that we have found in, 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 our, in our research. I have 20 seconds now, so we can see this. Or... Thank you. Thank you. The research I'm going to talk about the fourth part of, uh, of a research project we, we are conducting at CERN, which is about the creation and uh, transfer of uh, knowledge in big scientific experiments. This uh, focus here is on collaboration, which is very important in this kind of experiments. Uh, this is our, our research setting. This is uh, one of those big experiments that you find at CERN, uh, where recently the Higgs boson was, was found and the Nobel Prize was, was got for. Uh, what is important here is that uh, this kind of research is performed by huge teams of about thousands of uh, researchers 
and in hundreds of institutions involved in the in the research. And of course, the collaboration patterns within these projects are very complex. Uh, but if you want if you want to study the, the collaboration with the normal methodologies, which is looking at the research papers published in journals, you see that uh, it is not possible because this is the kind of papers they publish. Uh, in them, all the collaboration, the 3,000 scientists sign the paper. So there is no way to look at the, which are the, the different uh, specific collaborations within the, the project. So what we do here is uh, using uh, internal databases of preprints of the collaboration, where you, you know each, each scientist, uh, what each scientist has done and, and which are the collaborations, the institutions involved in the collaboration of each part of the project, we can look at, at the collaboration network. This is the network, and what we find here is the patterns of collaboration within this kind of project is very different from the normal collaboration that you find outside big science. For instance, uh, the density of collaboration is much higher. You find much more collaboration uh, between the groups. The shape of the collaborations in terms in terms of number of, uh, of collaborations between groups is also different. And also, if you look at the, the structure of the clustering of the different institutes working together, you find that uh, factors that are, are, not, are important in other settings, like geographical proximity, are not important here. So it is worth studying this, this kind of collaborations. And uh, that's what we, we have tried to contribute with this point. With this Thank you. So, copyright and technology have always evolved together. Um, uh, from the first printing press in the Gutenberg printing press to the what we call the Internet Galaxy, copyright laws have always been evolving to meet the new forms of creation, new works, and the new markets, new exploitation markets. During all these centuries, copyright has proven to be a, a good tool to foster creation and investment in creation. The question we are facing nowadays is whether copyright is still valid in this digital world that makes it so difficult to exploit copies. Um, does it still work as a tool to foster creation, to incentivate any kind of creative, professional, or economic input? This is the question. And some say that copyright has lost any meaning nowadays and that we should just give it up. Before we give it up, the aim of this project is to wonder whether by fine-tuning the copyright laws that we have nowadays, we should find some solutions to make it still a valid tool to foster cultural growth and incentivate free speech. Here are four issues that I was uh, trying to refer to. First is the traditional concepts of authorship and originality. The myriad of amateur creations that we see on Facebook and YouTube are a good example that everybody is becoming a creator nowadays. Mashups, all kind of appropriation art is really stretching the traditional concepts of who is an author and what is a protected work, an original work. Do we want copyright to foster these new kind of creations or do, do we want previous pre-existing authors to avoid new forms of creations. Second uh, item is uh, the rights, the exclusive rights we're granting to creators. Is it too far? Does it go too far? Do we need to turn any use of an online work into an act of exploitation? And do we need to turn any user into a licensee? Should we, um, should we leave into the sole hands of the copyright owners the decision as to which new markets and which technologies are going to evolve and we're going to be using as users. Limits. The limits to the exclusive rights are fundamental. The public domain is absolutely necessary for the cultural growth, for the fostering further creation. And last but not least, um, copyright has not, is not, no longer a tool for professionals for markets, it's a tool for the users, for society. And the online public licenses, the open licensing is a good example of it. Everybody is a creator, everybody is a user. License, okay. <laughs>
So um, the, um, the, as you may know, uh, women are really underrepresented in uh, engineering and technology studies, but uh, with regard to uh, science, they are very well represented, uh, uh, except uh, for science, uh, for physical science. So uh, taking into consideration this aspect, we wanted to uh, look at uh, the best predictors uh, of students' uh, aspirations uh, of um, uh, STEM studies, and uh, taking into account this uh, first premise that I mentioned, we uh, split uh, the um, uh, STEM studies into um, science, I mean experimental, and health studies, and technology technological studies. Drawing on uh, the theory of, uh, of uh, expectancy value uh, theory um, um, of motivations and choices, uh, we uh, run a, a couple of uh, logistic um, regression analysis in order to try to look at the best predictors of students' gender choices uh, related to this uh, couple of STEM studies. So, um, um, this um, um, results, uh, I, I will go right into the results, so that uh, gender plays a, a major role in the prediction of technological studies. And um, uh, I have um, also to say that this is a longitudinal study, I have so many uh, things on my head, I'm forgetting about this. And when um, uh, looking at the results, we see that uh, students uh, who um, uh, in the second year of, uh, of ESO, secondary education, um, uh, have uh, an, I'm a little bit lost of the data. So when they are, um, they, they report have high grades in, um, uh, in natural science and also a high perceived value of technology and they are uh, boys, they are more likely to pursue um, technological studies. However, um, students uh, who, at, uh, when they were um, um, at time one uh, in secondary school, in the second course of secondary school, uh, they um, uh, reported high grades uh, of uh, Spanish and um, high perceived values of uh, um, uh, natural value uh, of uh, natural science and uh, high self-concept of mathematics uh, were more likely in the second. So, sorry. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. My name is Jordi Gavalda. I belong to the Urban Transformation in the Knowledge Society program. And I'm going to talk about this project, the European project that started in 2012, and it's going to be ended in 2014. Um, we are nine partners working in this project. Four of them are um, public administrations, as you can see, Ajuntament de Barcelona, Comuni di Genova, Comune di Bologna, and also the Greater London Authority. Uh, also, two technologic private companies and two research institutes uh, in which we have I and three. Um, the background, the background of the project is the implementation of this concept, the smart city. Smart city is a very broad concept as well. Um, as it, it's also a, a fuzzy um, concept. Now we are not going to talk a little, um, too much about that, but here you have what we understand by smart city in this project. High intensive, in, high tech in, intensive cities that connect people, information, and also structural elements, using ICT to transform the way in which services of public interest are delivered, making them more accessible, efficient, and transparent. As you can see, it's a quite um, technocentric um, definition of what is a city. Um, this is the main objective of this project, uh, to develop an operational approach to allow these ecosystems to do four things. Co-create, deploy, operate, and also explore mobile apps to offer services of public interest to citizens through an app store. 
the novelty of this project um, is that uh, integrates both open data and also uh, open ICT local infrastructures, which are now um, isolated, um, to do a common platform with all the four cities to, to deploy these, these services. Specifically, what we do from IN3 is to provide a sociological evaluation methodology of this project uh, to assess these three uh, issues that you have here, the social impact of the project, the, the, the outcomes of these ecosystems, and also the global validity of the model. Uh, to do that, uh, we have a social innovation approach um, as a theoretical background. And what we do is also putting users in the center of policy design. Not only researchers, governments, and businesses, but also users as well uh, in, what we, in what it is known as quadruple helix. Uh, finally, what we did is to design three axes of indicators. So I'm going to Yes, thank you. I'm going to explain a little bit about uh, the research I have been developing for two and a half years, more or less, uh, now. And it has focused on young transitions to agri-food, and also uh, it has focused on the experience of um, social class in a peripheral neighborhood of Barcelona. So I will point uh, three aspects as background. Uh, basically, uh, we have a labor market offering young people low chances of getting a job, low, low salaries, we all know, know that, I guess, and precarious conditions, but it is especially true for those with no qualifications. Second, immigrants as a category uh, for group classification has a negative connotation, at least in our context, uh, due to historical reasons and uh, because of previous immigration and immigration waves associated with poverty. And uh, third, um, uh, scholars have detected the need to um, make studies centered in an everyday life perspective to grasp the experience of uh, group classification and social class in the environments of uh, young people, and in this case, uh, well, the young people I work with, and also the need of studies problematizing online everyday spaces of interaction, such as uh, uh, commercial social network sites, that in my case are mainly Facebook and YouTube, as you may have imagined. So the objective of my research was mainly to understand how the classification of school failures and immigrants are related to socio-economic inequality by exploring how they negotiate different normative expectations uh, from different contexts across offline and online and uh, in a moment of uh, transition to adulthood. If you have uh, questions about this, I will be glad to, to respond them later if uh, uh, it's not that clear. Well, the method I used was mainly an ethnography, a nine-month ethnography uh, in both online and offline places of interaction. I focused on a small group of, uh, of young people, basically, um, who attend vocational training programs and I observed, participated, and documented uh, what, yes, their practices uh, of them and other people involved in their everyday uh, settings. So, yes, I'm, I'm going to present uh, four main conclusive results. The first one is that cultural and economic processes should always, uh, from my point of view, be studied uh, um, together, not separate separately as uh, it, it's being done. The meaning of terms referring to cultural or national origins, such as uh, Romanian or Latin, are constituted by socio-economic disadvantage. Also, uh, school dropping out is also related to these conditions of... Okay. Good afternoon. To promote innovation in some countries like uh, Colombia and Spain, the talk about the importance, the relevance to promote innovation with regional knowledge maps. But how to do that? About it, we have working, we have working and thinking in Hochschule Hannover during the year that is a work in process, and we have uh, made make some conclusions. Uh, firstly, the challenges that we, we might resolve is which contents and which structures this 
uh, regional knowledge map should have. <coughs> Secondly, which information sources can we employ to extract this information? And thirdly, how extract data? So that we have employed at this moment uh, three methods. These three methods are uh, document analysis, network analysis, and text mining, concretely, and automatic classification and work extension. We are working in four lines. The first is which are the components of these regional knowledge maps. So the infrastructure, the structures, the processes, the uh, regional actors, and so on. Uh, secondly, which are the interaction between these uh, actors and the components? Uh, thirdly, uh, which are specifically the uh, information sources into regions where we are applying our research question, that is Lower Saxony in uh, Germany and Catalonia. And finally, uh, the research, uh, the, work, the work in the line is about the keyword extraction, the, which uh, controlled vocabularies can be useful to identify the knowledge, to level this knowledge that we are identifying in this, um, in this uh, work. And finally, I want uh, to say that uh, the theoretical framework that we are using is based in four disciplines, that is knowledge management, uh, intelligence and territorial, uh, competitive and territorial intelligence, national and regional innovation systems, and text mining. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Jordi Duran. I'm going to talk about machine detection. And, but let me start by asking you two questions. First question is, uh, have you uh, cheated or have you ever uh, copied? Uh, no? No? <laughs> Forget the, this, this project. But if your answer is yes, uh, <laughs> uh, have you been aware of it? Uh, most students uh, not admit uh, to this behavior, but you know, uh, uh, you are a teacher, more of you, uh, 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 they uh, have done. So, uh, for that reason, Pagpaji Pag exists. <laughs> Pagpaji is a tool to detect uh, if an assignment is a word-for-word -word copied or not. It's the first step in plugin detection workflow, which involves these three objectives. The first one is funding mechanism uh, to detect non-original work. Uh, Pagplagi is one of, of them mechanisms. The second one, and we think it's the most important, that we uh, encourage proper use of the three party and information. And the last one, uh, you know, uh, establishing protocols to handle cases of copies is, is so important for for our university. Well, this project uh, has been running since September uh, 2010, and this semester uh, I, uh, it's used uh, in 700 uh, subjects involving 20,000 students and uh, processing <coughs> more or less uh, 100,000 documents. So uh, the project is useful for large, uh, for, subject, uh, so for subjects with large number of uh, students. Imagine you, uh, if you have uh, 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 100 uh, handings and you can, it's difficult to, to, to check with with hand, no? So the teacher has a results, and the results shows a, a person of similarity, and they only need to check between uh, seventy and hundred percent of similarity. 
we get some conclusions. The first one, and obviously, and I'm. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, let's pretend time for, for a moment, for your more three minutes, talk, that we are social engineers and um, effective software problems. And I ask him, you, um, what do you, what do you think? How we can promote a knowledge society or more competitiveness in in economy? Uh, to me, the question, the key question, the key response is satisfaction. Uh, satisfaction is one of the most powerful uh, force in human beings, and without the promise of getting more satisfaction, uh, we don't go forward. We don't do our best. Uh, and when people are together, uh, pursuing clear and satisfactory goals, society also benefits from the common effort of, of all of us. The knowledge society needs enthusiastic workers who bring on innovation and creativity. My research <coughs> aims at exploring high-skilled careers, the milestone that men and women uh, find along their life course, and how their lives are transforming in a global, fluid, and complex society. Social processes operate under all their roles, all roles, uh, patriarchal or hierarchical structures, distribution of power <coughs> in organizations, uh, recruitment, recruitment and promotion of careers through merits, which is uh, an accumulative process of merits rather than an evaluation of uh, valuable competences to solve problems. So what is excellence, as uh, Adriana Bogni said before? My projects focus on these topics, providing relevant results uh, for human resources public policies. Policies. For example, the mutual influence of personal and professional lives suggests that mobility programs and attracting uh, uh, talent schemes should involve social and family context uh, of their researchers, of course. Uh, scientific and research organizations should peer into more inclusive and diverse environments for pursuing excellence young, and competitiveness through no lineal and non-traditional traditional careers. So women overcome hardships at a high cost. So gender policies are necessary to mentor women towards ambitious careers. In summary, my work addresses how we can introduce satisfaction into the design of human resources policy, assuming this process is essential to strengthening the knowledge society. Thank you very much. Well, this is a project to explore the compatibility, the tensions between peer production on one side and science on the other. What is peer production? Peer production is a shorter way to refer to this uh, ugly name, mass online commons based peer production, which is basically the way uh, free software and Wikipedia and all many other things are organized, are done. And uh, why to explore the compatibility between these kind of things and science? Because uh, there are uh, in the last years many initiatives, phenomena, even movements within science to import some features from peer production to the realm of science. You see here open access publishing, open research, citizen science. So we wanted to uh, explore this very broad issue and then we translate it into a more uh, manageable uh, pro uh, problem, which is taking one example of peer production, Wikipedia, and then a part of science, which is faculty members. So we uh, developed our research project uh, aimed to explore and explain faculty perceptions, attitudes, and practices uh, in Wikipedia. We designed a large survey that we sent to all faculty members. Uh, what? Thank those of you that answered the, uh, the questionnaire. And also to all <coughs> faculty members from Pompeo Fabra. We got more than uh, 900 uh, answers. And next. These are some of the findings uh, we, we have, though we have not finished yet. First one, most faculty members are regular users of Wikipedia. And this is contrary to common understanding and to previous studies. So we, we you, use Wikipedia even as much as students do. Second, the difference is that we don't tell 
we don't think it's good to tell our colleagues that we use Wikipedia and we uh, keep it in a private uh, sphere. So Wikipedia is more or less like porno, at least within. <laughs> I mean, no one is using it, but uh, data say nothing. Now, colleagues are, they are a very strong role model for uh, these kind of things. And that means that the more we think colleagues use Wikipedia, we use it more. And the more we think they like it, we like it more, which is a bit uh, strange. Not so strange if we think that science is a very, is a very peer uh, culture. Uh, then quality is also mostly seen positively. This is also contrary to previous expectations. Uh, quality is not a big, uh, big concern for faculty members. And I uh, will jump to the last one. Uh, another the striking uh, finding is that people from hard sciences and engineers do use more Wikipedia and do think it is of better quality. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm presenting today the uh, project called Masal Talk, which in Hebrew, for those of you, of you who don't speak Hebrew, means good luck. So good luck to everybody. And well, this is an in progress uh, project that will finish next year, the end of next year. Um, it's a quite innovative project in the sense that it tries to see how advanced technologies um, can be useful for groups in risk of exclusion. So that's why we accepted to uh, be in that, in that project because we thought it was a quite innovative project. The main purpose of the project uh, is to develop multifunction mobile ap applications for low-income recent uh, arrived immigrants in Europe. This is a, a project within the seventh uh, European uh, framework uh, program and we are many partners uh, some of us are coming from universities but the majority are uh, technology, <coughs> technology developers uh, te uh, corporations and <coughs> NGOs also so um, the um, this triangle between uh, mobiles te um, technologies migrants and arrival is a quite interesting uh, combination of elements for us. Uh, basically, um, that means that we are trying to answer to two questions. The first one is how can mobile technology technologies shape a more accessible or easy arrival of immigrants? And also how place, as a second question, how place uh, is kind of reconfigured pre in, in migration context. This is, um, oh, sorry, sorry, and sorry again. Well, I will leave it this way. Um, and this is the, um, well, the, the, the outline of, of the project. Uh, we identified four different needs uh, of, of immigrants community building, information assistance, context awareness, and informal learning. Each one has its own technological application or different technological applications from GeoRadar uh, uh, to uh, text lens, uh, serious games, and incidental learning framework. So um, for us, the main challenge is this, the uh, try to balance social and technological perspectives. Uh, in that kind of project of development, technological development, this is a quite big challenge. Um, hello, hello everyone. Uh, so SSA is uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. So what I'm presenting now is uh, my thesis of doctorate. I'm here as a visiting scholar with a group of journal ICT with Anna Maria gonzalez <laughs> Um, I'm doing a research on migration of highly skilled women that migrate from Sub-Saharan Africa to Europe. Um, I'm starting my work with uh, some aspects. So the first is that actually the migration of women from Sub-Saharan Africa has, has really grown at a rate uh, uh, much higher than in the other continents uh, in the last 20 years. And also it's now differentiated by motivation. So if firstly it was like more connected to family reunification, now it's more uh, is starting to increase also the motivation of education 
and uh, jobs. The second uh, part is uh, connected to development studies. And actually, that the, the development studies are saying that uh, women, uh, usually immigrant women, remit uh, less money than men, but actually remit uh, like more in the social way, so they are investing more in social capital in the origin countries. And uh, the third aspect is actually that uh, the literature is saying that uh, actually the uh, women's migrant women in, from Sub-Saharan Africa to Europe are especially nurses. So it seems that we have just nurses that are coming especially to UK. So, but what about other women? And what about the, the role of highly skilled women in that context? You know. Um, so where are they from? There are no. There is kind of really huge lack of data. <coughs> So um, then my purpose is actually that, to find out uh, which is the profile of these women and to see which are their migratory strategies and actually to see uh, in the end which is their social remittance behavior. And I do that with the time geography and of course approach uh, uh, point of view. Uh, and I'm actually doing uh, uh, with a questionnaire uh, and with uh, uh, semi-structural interviews that want to outline their uh, social remittance, but also their well-being in the in the context. Uh, now, I'm actually the research is still ongoing, and uh, I'm now analyzing the results of the questionnaire, and I'm uh, and I'm now running the interview, the semi-structured interview, for seeing which is their social remittance behavior. Um, about the social, well, they are for what I, I have now as data is that they are quite young and they belong especially from Nigeria, Kenya, Cameroon and Democratic Republic of Congo and they go especially to UK, to France, sorry, to UK and to uh, Netherlands and also Belgium but that's also for colonial, colonial reason, reasons and uh, other reasons. <laughs> Thank you. What I would like to try to do today is to briefly introduce a project we are developing, the Digital Cultural Research Program, in collaboration with the Media del Mila Italian Company and the Foundation, uh, Italian Foundation that is Media del Mila Onlus and that private company. Uh, what is Digital World? Digital World is mainly a platform that will offer uh, two different levels of analysis of two different problems. The first one is to try to deepen the concept of cognitive design according to what is changing in terms of uh, interfaces. What I mean that uh, the interfaces have broken what is the concept of traditional linearity because now we are having mm, more confidence with uh, uh, crowd-driven interfaces, uh, tactile interfaces, a different kind of system that are asking us to change the way we can have a cognition of the system in front of us and the different relation in terms of production of contents. The second aim, that is more linear, more easy, is to create a platform to, um, uh, to present contents and to create a, co a collaborative environment in a connective way. Uh, what you can see here is exactly what we are trying to create. It's a world, a digital world where each type can represent a different kind of content that we can produce and we can upload directly online and that can help us to try to connect different people. Uh, different people in terms of uh, collaboration from web learning environment, from producing of video, for storage, for educational framework. That is to say a tool that could improve the quality of learning in distant uh, system, in distant collaboration and what could be useful in terms of adopting a bottom-up approach to create contents. Uh, the result at the moment is a multi-portal system that can offer educative board for classes, multidimensional presentation system, responsive, uh, responsive training course system, a guided repository manager, a smart city totem info system, for example, and so on, tactile interactive guide for cultural heritage, video production streaming system, a conference talk manager, and many other systems that we are embedding in this uh, web app uh, with uh, the aim to offer an open-ended and absolutely free model to produce and to offer people to produce by themselves new contents. And finish the Thank you. <laughs>
I'm here in the College of Visiting Scholar in the INFI in the research program which is digital culture. I work with Matteo, with Derek, they are also collaborators in this project, and also with Andrea Cruciani, that's not is an external research. Well, uh, this project, uh, we started to work in this field a long time ago, and uh, the background is a little bit um, social media, internet, wearable technologies are quickly transforming urban spaces and smart cities in which ele electronic and analogical dimensions merge. We are talking about merging electronic and analogical. Well, in this project, however, the description of this electronic uh, knowledge in physical spaces is mostly linked to functional or commercial market uh, aspects, dimensions. We'd like to add the knowledge dimension. So um, the objective is to go beyond the limitations of smart cities and to contextualize digital knowledge to merge analogical and digital, new, to develop new forms of merging the analogical and digital, to contextualize the learning in hybrid environments, to expand the concept of objects, environments, monuments, architecture into a new kind of thing, and to create knowledge environments in the hybrid, transforming things into knowledge doors. There have, we had some uh, previous and early achievements for these projects. There are three main ones that are the wire book and electronic imaging project, uh, the electronic imaging for condensed imaging, a uh, condensed matter project that was developed with, in association with the Center, Centro Cultural uh, Santa Monica here in Barcelona uh, two years ago. And then there is a, a pilot project that it was developed for a European project for the great wine capitals and global network, and it's, um, it's a big project as well. So, um, we think that the new steps are to develop the knowledge interfaces embedded in the cities, in smart cities, and try uh, to use these as new ways to disseminate knowledge and also to disseminate knowledge, scientific knowledge. So, this conference can be part of these knowledge interfaces that are embedded in the city. And we have more. <laughs> Good afternoon, I'm Ms. Cinta Maria. I'm going to, yes, I'm going to, to present a collective work with Anna Madrid and Andrea Cusco Martinez, titled Work Life Balance, Gender and the World. We learn some contradictions. The aim of our research is to identify and, and analyze uh, the tensions uh, it may give rise to refer to balancing the different areas of the lives of women teleworkers. We will point out that the uh, precise definition of telework must take into, con the, into consideration the complex web of tensions and contradictions that set it. The most important are the first one Overloading or liberation. Telework involves an overload of working in the sense that women uh, want to carry out both activities related to work and to family. But at the same time, it entails liberation, uh, a feeling of freedom that stems from the self management of their times uh, and lives. The second, a help or a hindrance for women. Uh, telework can entail the risk of reinforcing the traditional role of women uh, at home, but at the same time, uh, allow them a personal fulfillment uh, since uh, women teleworkers are able to carry out their role as mothers. Third, means <coughs> or new opportunities. Finally, uh, telework uh, frequently uh, entails ongoing professional opportunities. Women report that the labor market demands physical presence at work if you want to be promoted. But it also gives them many other professional advantages, uh, more efficiency, better performance, and so on. Telework and its relation with work-life balance is, as a matter of fact, an amplifier of tensions affecting 
women in the labor market, specifically these tensions stem from two ideologies, ideology of patriarchy and ideology of flexibility. The interrelation be between the two ideologies generates a kind of flexible patriarchy on which modern capitalism is based. <coughs> we claim that to understand the implication of teleworking for women, we must analyze and pay attention to the, the dynamics and effects of this flexible <laughs>